Hi, my name is Paul, and welcome to episode 20 of my monthly stock portfolio series, where I invest $100 of my own money each month into Canadian securities. And I do this series each month to track the ups and downs of investing so that I can show aspiring investors what to expect and what can be achieved by following a simple plan of regularly investing some of the money that's left over at the end of each month, even if that amount is $100 or less. In this month's episode, I'll be covering the second quarter financial results for the portfolio's two largest holdings, and I'll also be going through how my portfolio performed during the month of July. Plus, as always, I'll be showing you exactly how I'm going to be investing this month's $100 and the dividends that we earned. Now, really quickly, before we get into the video, you should be aware that there is a link in the description box of this video to the goals and rules that I've set out for investing within my monthly portfolio. But if you happen to be someone who prefers watching videos to reading, then you can also watch me go through everything in the first episode of the series, and a link to the playlist starting at episode 1 is available in the description box of this video as well. With that out of the way, let's get into the news. The first piece of news came out on July 11th, and that was MTY's second quarter financial report and conference call. Now, I've already made an in-depth video on the report, so I'm just going to briefly summarize some of the most important parts here, since there is a lot of other stuff to get to this month. Anyway, this quarter, MTY's revenue growth again was pretty scrambled and hard to decipher due to the large acquisitions that happened over the previous two quarters. But because these acquisitions mostly just affected the US and international portion of the business, we do have a much clearer review of the performance on the Canadian side. And everything there went fairly well, despite a slight decline in the retail segment, which was noted as being due to the government's regulation on grocery stores themselves. On the US and international portion of the business, however, after taking the time to go through and adjust for the non-recurring portions of the business, the pre-existing franchise growth was almost flat year over year, which is far from ideal. But this was the only sore spot in what otherwise was a very good quarter. See, this quarter, MTY's total net store closures came in at only four, which is a substantial improvement over prior quarters, and it highlights that the management's focus on this specific issue is having a positive effect. In addition to that, the free cash flow per share was up 77% compared to the same quarter last year. And this massive growth in profitability came during what historically has been among the slowest quarters for MTY. On the other hand, the upcoming third quarter is generally among MTY's best quarters for free cash flow. So assuming things don't go too far off the rails, we could be positioned to see record-breaking free cash flow performance come October especially considering that the management did mention that the capital expenditures are projected to be a few million dollars lower thanks to the completion of an expensive restaurant build. Noting that, this free cash flow prediction is my personal speculative opinion, and it should not be relied upon as fact or something that will happen. This quarter, a lot of that free cash flow was used to pay down the debt, eliminating about $27.4 million worth. And given that this is another one of the management's key focuses, I'm personally expecting the total debt to come down rapidly, similar to the scenario that played out post-pandemic. Assuming, of course, that there are no other major shakeups. Finally, it appears as though the challenge of finding labor is starting to stabilize, and the company is performing quite well. And even more on that note, according to the management, it looks like, in spite of the recession fears that had been projected, MTY has not been experiencing any slowdowns. Plus, the management concluded by reassuring shareholders that debt repayment is the company's top priority alongside finding ways to add new locations of existing franchises. So, all in all, it was a fairly good quarter, and the management appears to be doing all of the right things, in my opinion. But, that made this next piece of news even more shocking. About one week after the release of the report, the company's founder and largest shareholder, Stanley Ma, decided to dispose of a whopping 465,000 shares. Thankfully, after reading through the early warning report, it doesn't look like this is anything to be concerned with. See, Stanley Ma is in his mid-70s and was looking to free up some cash for personal reasons 
including donating about a million dollars worth to charity. In addition to that, Ma still owns over 3 million shares of the company and has retained his position as the president and chairman of the board. So, with the vast majority of his net worth still tied up in the company's shares and his continued guidance and oversight of the company, I don't think this is an indictment of the current management or the stock's valuation. Moving along, next we have to get into the Morgard North American Residential REIT's second quarter report, which came out on July 26th. And this one didn't get its own video, mostly because everything went about as predictably as was expected. The occupancy in both the US and Canada remained stable, and the average monthly rent also continued to increase, and it's projected to continue to do so in the coming quarters. This of course led to higher funds from operations per share, even when adjusting for organic growth. Plus, the REIT's indebtedness and interest rates on mortgages rose relatively in line with what was expected due to increasing federal interest rates in Canada. Now, there was one minor unexpected subsequent event, but it just had to do with a refinancing agreement on two Florida properties for a total of $36.8 million at a rate of 5.66%. But we already know that refinancing is a part of the REIT strategy, so it shouldn't be surprising to see this sort of thing happen from time to time. Now, the main thing that I wanted to cover was the management's commitment to the buyback program. And so far this year, over 665,000 shares have been repurchased, and most of those came in this quarter as you can see here. In fact, this quarter the REIT bought back more than 1% of the total shares outstanding, which is really big for just one quarter. Plus, with a big dividend payer like Morgard, buying back these shares means that there will be less money that the company needs to pay out on a monthly basis. So, when more shares are bought back in the short term, the REIT will be able to retain more money in the long term, and that money can be used to do things like make growth acquisitions, pay out larger dividends, or buy back even more shares, which is what I personally believe is the best option in Morgard's case. This is because Morgard's shares trade at a colossal discount to the net asset value. This quarter, the net tangible value of Morgard's book came in at $47.09 per share, which is a strong increase over last quarter's $45.51 per share. The best part of this is that Morgard repurchased its shares at an average price of $17.22, which is about a third of the underlying value of Morgard's property. So Morgard essentially paid out $17.22 per share in return for $47.09 per share in underlying net asset value, and this results in continued shareholders growing their ownership of the underlying assets by much more than the market value that the shares were repurchased at. So that was very exciting to see, and on the conference call it was also noted that the REIT has plans to continue to be conservative in preserving cash, but the excess capital that they have will be allocated first towards repurchasing shares through the NCIB. So, all in all, this was a very good, but expected quarter out of the REIT. And it sounds like they're planning on going full steam ahead on share repurchases, which I'll talk about a little bit more when it comes time to actually buying this month's shares. Last up, on July 26th, GoEasy announced that they will be reporting their second quarter's results on August 9th, and they'll be holding a conference call on the 10th. And I'm fairly certain that I will be making a video on this one. Moving on, let's get into how each stock performed this month. Starting off with the best performer, at the beginning of last month I did not purchase any shares of GoEasy. Nonetheless, the stock rallied upwards by over 16% when factoring in the $1.56 in quarterly dividends that the portfolio received. But even without those dividends, GoEasy easily would have been the best performing holding in the portfolio with a gain of 14.7% or $16.48 per share. Next up was MTY Food Group, and last month I bought about one third of a share at a cost basis of $62.40 per whole share. And throughout the month of July, the share price rose to $64.51, achieving a one month gain of 3.38%, or $2.11. And the portfolio did not receive any dividends from MTY this month. 
And the worst performer this month was the Morgard North American Residential REIT, of which I purchased five shares last month. And despite the fairly normal earnings results, over the last couple of weeks or so, the share price has crumbled from $16.80 back down to $15.85, which was a decline of 0.23% if we include the $4.56 of distributions that were paid out. But without those dividends included, the shares would have declined by a total of 5.65%, or $0.95 cents per share. Now, unfortunately, because Morgard was by far the largest purchase within the portfolio in the month of July, the total portfolio gain was pretty weak, coming in at only 1.97% if we include the dividend. But without that dividend boost, the value of last month's invested capital would have declined by 3.9%. Meanwhile, most of the benchmarks were paid out strong quarterly dividends, which aided them in putting up gains in the double-digit percentages. If we factor out the dividends, then my portfolio still did the worst this month. Then we had the two Canadian ETFs, which achieved 1.33% and 1.74%. Next was the S&P 500, which grew by a solid 3.1%. But the best performer out of the group was the Global Value ETF which was actually the only one not to receive a dividend, though it does have a massive annual payout looming on the horizon. Now, overall, most of my holdings performed quite well this month, but with Morgard making up almost 70% of the portfolio, its little dip towards the end of the month brought down the other holdings' performances in a pretty drastic way. From the start of the series in January 2022, up until the market close on August 3rd, 2023, so far I've invested $1,941.43 of personally contributed capital and dividends. Currently, the value of my portfolio is now sitting at $1,905.27. So, this marks a loss of $36.16, or 1.86%. This looks like a minor step backwards in terms of results, but I'm very happy with my holdings and I think that I still just need a little bit more time for everything to play out. And on the bright side, I am still ahead of the $1,900 that I put into the Wealthsimple account. It's just the reinvested dividends that I'm a touch behind on. Speaking of being a bit behind, on this graph, the green line represents my portfolio's performance when factoring for how much money has been contributed to the portfolio. And as you can see, all of the competition went up last month and my portfolio went down and is sitting in last place, barely breaking even and very far away from the red goal line with the stars, which indicates a 12% annualized rate of return. Meanwhile, the S&P 500 and the Global Value ETF are way above the line. But as bad as things look, I'm not too worried because I still believe that my underperformance is temporary. And I'm also looking forward to the opportunity to buy Morgard North American Residential REIT shares in the monthly portfolio at what will likely be the lowest price point since April of 2022. And I'll be getting a larger chunk of the REIT at that, since the REIT's total shares outstanding are at the lowest point since 2019. Plus, the management has likely continued repurchasing even more shares subsequent to the report's publication which will show up in next quarter's results. And they've also stated their intentions to continue repurchasing shares going forwards into the future. Now, really quickly, if the company is able to buy up the same amount of shares each quarter, then we can expect over a 10-year period, 47% of the current shares outstanding will have been repurchased. 10 years also happens to be the amount of time that it would take one to triple their money at a 12% annualized rate of return. So, if I want to hit my 12% annualized goal, I'd need Morgard's share price to achieve the underlying net asset value by 2033. The question is, how likely is this? Well, we already know that the Morgard Corporation and the CEO, Ray Sahi, own about 25% of the shares outstanding combined. These shares are highly unlikely to be sold which means that over the hypothetical 10-year repurchasing period, only 25% of the current float would be actively available for trading. And I can't imagine that the discount would continue to remain unnoticed at that point. Now, that's not to say that it couldn't, 
but in a scenario where the share prices stay the same, despite shrinkage in total share count, that would leave the underlying value of the shares at more than double where they are now. And this would represent a near 6x gain from that point, which would make it even more desirable considering how many fewer shares there'd be out there and how much more likely the rapid inflection point would be. So the Morgard residential REIT might look like a goose egg for quite a while, but I strongly believe it will eventually pay out some serious market beating gold in the long run. And in the meantime, I get to collect a nice dividend that can be used to reinvest into even more shares. Now, of course, this does assume that the REIT's property values are accurate, which I believe they are, and that the REIT will continue to buy back shares over the long run, which is a little bit more uncertain since the company has gone after property acquisitions in the past instead of going for those undervalued shares. So those are two of the potential fail points in my investment hypothesis. However, I also have two important factors working for me, those being the security of the business, i.e. renting properties in growing North American cities, and the high likelihood of the value of these properties also naturally rising as those cities that they're located in become more densely populated, leading to an increase in rental demand. For me, this is a pretty good trade-off, and I'd suspect that the point of critical mass will be hit well within a decade. That said, while I am excited about this investment, I could be wrong, so do not blindly follow me or anyone else into any investment. Always do your own research first. With that, this month I'm planning on going all in on Morgard shares, which hopefully will be at most in the low $16 range. Then, with whatever's left over, I'll be buying shares of MTY Food Group. Since GoEasy already looked a little bit tough to get behind at $105, and now that it's rapidly approaching $130, I certainly don't have plans to buy any more, given that there hasn't been any real changes to the underlying business that I've been made aware of. Okay, here we are inside of the Wealth Simple account. I have $106.12, and it looks like we'll be getting more guard shares for a bit cheaper than was expected. So let's start off by getting six of those. And we got about $10 left and I'm gonna put all of that into MTY Food Group. So we'll go 10.96. All right, and once this order comes through, I'll have everything prepared and I'll see you back in just a sec. Okay, I've just received confirmation that I have successfully bought six shares of the Morgard North American Residential REIT for $15.86 each, and my buy order of 0.1695 shares of MTY Food Group came in at a cost basis of $64.62 per whole share, leaving my portfolio holding one cent of cash after my orders were filled. So as of the markets close on Friday, August the 4th, the portfolio holds 87 shares of the Morgard North American Residential REIT worth about $1,373, roughly 6.48 shares of MTY Food Group worth a little over $418, and the same 1.62 shares of GoEasy that is now worth nearly $215. And as I just said a moment ago, there is one cent left in cash currently being held. Now, getting into the dividend information, both Morgard and GoEasy paid out a combined dividend totaling $6.12, which is enough to buy a whole chocolate cake so we can celebrate this month's dividend being the largest one yet. Plus, since the portfolio's inception, I've now received $47.55 in dividends, with over $30 of that coming in the last seven months. To put that into perspective, even though we're only seven months through year two, the portfolio has already earned almost double the amount that was earned in the first full year. And next month, we're projected to hit a new record high dividend payment of $6.44, with Morgard paying out $4.86 and MTY Food Group paying out the remaining $1.58. Also worth mentioning, with the recent purchase of Morgard shares, unless I decide to sell some of those shares, or the dividend gets cut, my portfolio will now never receive less than $5 in dividends per month. And 
If I were to just leave the portfolio as it is and collect the dividends in cash for the next 12 months, assuming no changes were made, I would now expect to receive $75.35, which is a 6.33% increase from last month. And this moved the yield on contributed capital up four basis points to 3.77%. So the dividends are really starting to come along. Now, before I conclude, I want to give a brief update on the non-series related content that I've been working on. And actually, the latest project is mostly done. But unfortunately, because my laptop isn't quite powerful enough to render video projects with multiple layers of complex edits, I've come to the realization that regardless of how many times I try to change around the edits and re-render the video, I'm going to continue to run into this issue where the transitions will have sporadic, seemingly random glitches that ruin the intended visual effects. Fortunately, I do have a much more powerful PC that I built a few years back, which should be able to deal with this issue, but I won't have access to that computer for another month or so. So, assuming that my PC with a stronger processor and video card will be able to get the video rendering done properly, that video should come out sometime towards the end of August, or possibly in early September since I don't really want to put out a poor quality video that I put tons of work into. Anyway, hopefully that explains why I haven't gotten a larger video out, despite having hinted at it in the comments a couple of months back. But that's all I really have to say for now, so before you leave, please remember that this video is not financial advice and that I am not a financial advisor. This video was made entirely for the purpose of providing inspiration and insight into my personal investment decisions, and it should not be used as a substitute for doing your own research. This video does not have the information required to make good investment decisions on individual securities. So again, I am not a financial advisor, I'm just a Canadian who likes to invest and share my opinions with others. And in doing so, I hope that I was able to provide you with something of value. And if I did, then please consider sharing with anyone else who may also benefit from it. Thanks for watching all the way to the end, and enjoy the rest of your day.